Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tamiko Brown Nagan, the faculty director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute uh, for Race and Justice. I'm so glad to see all of you, especially on this day of the, what are they calling it, the Four Easter. And welcome to today's lecture by Catherine Lehman, who is the chair of the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. She's going to discuss persistent disparities in uh, the funding of public education and the need for a federal remedy. Now, it's always the right time to examine whether the nation's students are receiving the equal educational opportunity to which they are entitled under law, and yet it's especially fitting for the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute to host this program. Our namesake, the brilliant 1922 uh, graduate of Harvard Law School and architect of the NAACP's legal strategy to end segregation in education, actually spent some of his early years in law practice documenting uh, disparities in the funding of public education in the South. Uh, so Houston knew then what we still know now, which is access to quality education makes all the difference uh, in an individual's path in life. It is the mission of the Houston Institute to host convenings like this, one, to keep the conversation about access and success in education alive. We depend on the generosity of uh, friends and supporters like you to realize our mission, and we appreciate your support. One final note uh, about logistics. Due to the weather and Chair Lehman's need to depart on an earlier flight, we'll conclude our program today around 1245, and uh, unfortunately, the Chair will not be able to take questions following her remarks. And now, I present to you John Manning, the Dean of Harvard Law School. Uh, Dean Manning's presence here today signifies his support for the Institute, for our mission, and his respect for the work of the Civil Rights Commission. Dean Manning, thank you. Thank you, Professor Brown Nagan. Um, I'm really delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Catherine Lehman, uh, who is at, at the very beginning of a six year term as chair of the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. Uh, Chair Lehman is a graduate of the Yale Law School and a summa cum laude graduate of, a graduate of Amherst College. Uh, she clerked for Judge Norris on the Ninth Circuit, a truly great judge, and then spent a decade at the ACLU of Southern California, where she rose to be assistant legal director before moving on to be director of public impact litigation, I'm sorry, director of impact litigation at Public Counsel, which is literally the largest pro bono firm in uh, the country. Um, from there, she moved on to be Assistant Secretary of Education for Civil Rights from 2013 to 2017, and was nominated by President Obama to her current position and confirmed unanimously by the Senate in December of 2016, which is very impressive. Um, and um, uh, we're, we're so happy to have her here today. Uh, in a talk entitled, Children Can't Wait, Why Congress Should Declare a Federal Right to Public Education, Chair Lehman will speak to us about the pressing issue of equality in education. She has won so many awards uh, that they are too numerous to uh, list, and I will not uh, cut into the time by listing them, but we are very, very um, uh, honored and, and delighted to have her here. Uh, and so without uh, any further delay, Chair Catherine Lehman. Thank you for the lovely and generous introduction, and thank you all for coming out on the about-to-be nor'easter snow day here. And I am really just thrilled to be with you. It is my pleasure to be with you to talk about this topic in general, and especially my pleasure to be here after a real question about whether I would be able to leave DC where the snow has already begun, and <laughs> it's significantly more challenging to get out uh, there. So uh, thank you for this, and thank you all for today's focus on this topic and what I hope are every day to come, a focus on equity and, and a conversation about how we can achieve equity for our students in schools. It's a, it's a conversation that sadly, as Professor Ron Nagan mentions, uh, we have been thinking about in the civil rights legal community for 
many, 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 too many decades at this point. And it certainly has been a recurring theme of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights throughout the 60-year history of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights also. The charge of the commission is to be the nation's eyes and ears with respect to civil rights and to advise the President and the Congress and the American people about what effective civil rights policy would be and how well or not well the United States government lives up to satisfying the existing civil rights policies that we have. And in the life of the commission, the commission has over and over and over again visited the question of equity and inequity in schools. The commission called for federal law that ultimately became the Elementary and Secondary Education Act uh, as um, among the earliest calls that the commission made about the need for important civil rights reform. The commission has over and over and over again recommended ways to achieve better integration in schools, uh, more an equitable opportunity in schools, uh, ways to achieve the promise of affirmative action, and we, again, just this last January, issued a report about persisting inequities in American schools, this time focused on school finance inequity in an era of increasing racial and economic segregation in schools. Uh, you will not be surprised to hear that the majority conclusion of the report is that our nation's schools are profoundly unequal and that across the nation, public schools generally struggle to provide educational opportunity that lives up to the, uh, the promise that schools will be the great equalizer. Uh, the, the majority of the commission voted on a set of findings and recommendations and also voted to approve the report and I want to share what it is that we identified, but I also want to contextualize it. The, the same week that we issued the report was the week that there were national headlines about children having to wear coats in literally freezing cold temperature classrooms in Baltimore. And the, the reality is that the Baltimore superintendent said what is true, which is that we all knew. The mayor knew, the superintendent knew, the school board knew, the city knew that the children in Baltimore were at risk of heat failing, catastrophically failing, which is what happened this winter, uh, across many, 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 many schools for children in, in Baltimore, that, that we knew that that risk persisted for those kids. What the superintendent said is that the district had hoped for a mild winter so that they could forestall a need to repair and replace the heating systems because they did not have the funds. So the calculus being made in Baltimore that became all too public was a hope against hope about a mild winter, which as we know today, we did not achieve this winter, uh, and uh, a hope that we could forestall what are basic human needs for children whom we require to be in school every day. And so the nation witnessed children wearing parkas in class, uh, children struggling to learn in conditions that are inhumane at, at best. Baltimore is not an outlier. Baltimore is not alone. Many, 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 sadly, years before, uh, when I was litigating in California, and California does have much milder winters than Baltimore, but when I was litigating in California about education reform, we saw children in San Francisco who were having to wear coats in class because they didn't have functioning heat systems. And the then mayor happened to visit one of the classes to give a presentation, saw the children freezing, insisted that there be immediate reform, and got it fixed within 24 hours of his visit. But what he said at the time was, it shouldn't take a public figure coming to a school to see this for us actually to change the conditions of our schools. We have heard about profoundly unequal conditions related to heat, related to facilities, related to uh, the the instructional materials that we offer to students related to whom we, we place in front of our classrooms. We've heard these conditions in schools repeatedly over and over and over again across the country. The reality, as we excavated in the report that the commission issued, is that all across the nation we are asking our children to learn in profoundly unequal conditions, and it is because we are not funding our schools in ways that are consistent with actually achieving the equity ideal. The, the additional reality, and this is where we come to the crux of the problem. Not only do we know, not only have we elected as a nation not to deliver equity for our students, but in fact, the majority of our state systems are not designed 
to evaluate how you deliver high quality educational opportunity to the students who need it. Instead, they're designed based on how many dollars they have to spend, and that is what they spend, which is not a calculus that is focused on children. That is not a calculus that is focused on what equity should be in school. In addition, we know that racial segregation correlates with unequal allocation of resources, and nonetheless, School finance systems across the country, in state after state, are not designed to be responsive to that correlation for purposes of ensuring that the opportunity that we deliver in schools is equitable. And I want to I concretize that abstraction in a way that, that helps us to think about what that means for children in school. Fully, 77% of Latino students and 73% of black students attend schools that are majority students of color. That contrasts to 88% of white students who attend schools that are majority white. So when we now know that we don't operate school finance systems that think about equity and that think about how to deliver high quality education, we don't offer school finance systems that think about the correlation between race and inequality, but we do know that our schools are profoundly resegregated and we do know that all across the country, we are asking our children to learn in profoundly inequitable conditions. I think it's fair to say that it's time to think about how we can deliver education differently and what our next steps should be. We started by thinking about how not new this question is. I want to say it's also not new to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court in 1973 ruled to my dismay ruled that education is not a fundamental right as understood in the United States Constitution. It was a, I think, devastating, certainly low point in the litigation about educational equality. And in all of the years since 1973, education reformers, education civil rights thinkers have been thinking about how to relitigate that case, and how to, how to uh, demonstrate a different reality to the United States Supreme Court and how to use the state courts instead to achieve more equality uh, and whether and how to achieve policy change uh, that would negate that ruling and that would offer meaningful opportunity for students in schools. The, the, the record of that thinking since 1973 is, is varying success in state courts that uh, some states have uh, have ruled in, in useful ways about their state constitutional principles and have seen some changes secured uh, in their state litigation, but zero federal success to date. So uh, that's not a great record since 1973 to, to be contemplating this topic, but to have achieved so little actually uh, in terms of ma meaningful change for students in schools. My view, the view of the majority of the commission, is that Congress could act now and could put paid to that debate by creating a federal right to education. So we don't have to be contemplating what's the best litigation strategy, how do we uh, try to, to put this in front of the United States Supreme Court, or, or how many uh, states' Supreme Courts can we secure victories from to, to uh, cobble together a record that would generate a national understanding that we should do better by our students. But instead, Congress could, as it has through much civil rights litigation before now actually use the, the uh, basic principle that if you condition receipt of federal funds on a guarantee of achieving a substantive outcome, then you could create a federal right to education. So the commission's most recent report calls on Congress to do exactly that. I am uh, optimistic that that will be the next project for Congress after they work on the budget that is overdue. Uh, but in, nonetheless, I, I do think it's, it's very important to create the record for why that's important, what difference it would make for children. And even though uh, I uh, don't actually have high hope that Congress is going to act in the immediate term on that recommendation, I am mindful that the Commission's many reports over time sometimes required a few times to get to the basic principle that uh, federal law should follow from policy recommendations. I mentioned the commission called for passage of the Elementary and Secondary Educa uh, Education Act, and uh, that was a success. It was multiple reports that it took to, to call for that. The commission has influenced all of the federal civil rights laws that have been enacted in the 60 years of our life, and so I hope that we will be able to notch this as a victory at some point in the nearish future as well. The, the reality is that Hope is not enough. 
Our, our children deserve action now. Our children deserve better conditions in schools, better planning for them, better communication about what education is for them, better delivery of opportunity in schools than they are living with now. And, and I've said this, I want to say it again, we require them to live with it. It's not optional. The children are required to be in school. And so we ought to do better by them when they are sitting in these seats that we mandate for them. In addition to the equity principle, what it is that, that our children deserve, what is right for them as human beings, and recognizing what it is that we want for them uh, as, as people, it's also in our own self-interest to act now. What we teach children in school when we operate in equity that is visible to them in the way that they experience it, what we teach them is that you don't count, we don't believe in you, and your government is not there for you. Schools are the most consistent and profound relationship of government to person that students experience for the sustained period from when they're in kindergarten until they graduate uh, high school. And that ought to be a relationship where we are teaching the democracy that we want to live, where we are teaching civic engagement, we're teaching that there is a value to active participation in community. But what we say to children when we offer them schools where they have to huddle in coats because it is unconscionable uh, in the temperature or where, where they see rats in the classroom, where they don't have instructional materials, where there's a revolving door of substitutes because there is no permanent teacher for the class, where the schools are not prepared for them, what we say to them is that we don't believe in you. And that is, that is a lesson that they learn, that they take home, that is incredibly damaging. And that's, that is not an abstraction. I'm now going to speak to you not as the chair of the commission, but from my life as a civil rights litigator uh, many, many years ago, uh, litigating a, a case about educational inequality in California public schools. And we conducted focus groups for that case where we uh, had children, the very young elementary school children, middle school children, and high school children come and uh, participate in focus groups to talk about the conditions in their schools and the lessons that they were learning. And I sat, as the lawyer, I sat behind the glass so they couldn't see me, it looked like a mirror for them, and I could see what they were doing. And they had our expert asking them questions, and the expert would show them pictures of well-resourced schools. And these children, who we, we selected through random digit dialing, we did not know who they were, we did not know what they would say, they were not people that we had prepped, uh, which was a bit of a nail-biter for me, frankly, <laughs> as we were doing that, but uh, you know, we, had, we had selected them from schools that we knew to be under-resourced. And, and the experts showed them photos of schools that other children attend and asked what they thought about it. And the children said, well, those must be schools that white children attend, because they wouldn't give those resources to us. And that is the embodiment of the brown doll experiment in the modern era. That is the children reporting back what they learn in school, which is that our school doesn't believe in us. The children, the, the experts ask the children, what do you want in your ideal school? What would your ideal school have? The most devastating answer to me was from a middle school child who said, in my ideal school there would be toilet paper in the bathrooms, period. Not there would be toilet paper in the bathrooms and a teacher who loves me and a science lab that is uh, fully functional and a school that had electives that are really exciting and enriching for me. There would be toilet paper in the bathrooms in my ideal school. There were, there were the kindergartners who were sort of chirpy, loving school, excited, and you, know, you asked them what do they like about school, and, and they said, you know, I, I love school and my science teacher is so exciting and, and math is my favorite subject and they were, you know, sort of all the things that you want kids to say about school and then you ask, well, you know, what, what would you like in addition in your school? Well, it would be nice if I didn't have to share the book. It would be nice if I didn't have to wear my coat in class. But they're still really enthusiastic. You switch to the high school students and, you know, their high school students are a little too cool for school in the first place and so, you know, they're, they're less excited about science in their, in their reporting on school and, and, and what they volunteer but they're very clear about what's not available to them and what's not fair for them. And they say, 
You know, they're always talking about what it would take to go into college, and I don't understand why they don't give us that little push that we need, just the, just the materials we need so that we can get there. So I should be able to have a book in my class. And it was, it's profound what it is that the, that the kids are able to articulate about what they don't have and uh, what they need. So, so I have witnessed to my dismay what messages we are sending to our kids when we send them, we relegate them to schools that are as unequal as we know they continue to be. And when we say we know, but we're hoping for a mild winter, or we know, but maybe next year we'll buy the books because it's not, it's not our budget this year. Or you know, we know, but it's been hard to recruit teachers who are willing to stay in the schools. All of those we know but are doing profound disservice to the kids who have to be in fourth grade now and who are not to do fourth grade again. You know, the, the goal is for them to go on to fifth grade prepared and then, and then to go on to be able to achieve their dreams prepared because their schools were ready for them. So the, the time is now to uh, make sure that, that we send a different message to our children in school. And I am hoping that we in this room can take that lesson, take that message, and use it in advocacy for kids in schools, in advocacy with Congress, and in our thinking about what kind of democracy we want to live in. And there's more. The, the commission, having issued that report, is not resting on our laurels, thinking, OK, now we can, we can move on from education and uh, turn to other topics about civil rights and inequity, although we are also doing that. Um, but the commission held a briefing just last December about school discipline, which is in, uh, inextricably intertwined with this question of the kinds of resources that we offer to our students and the, and the caliber and quality of opportunity that we offer to our students. And uh, the, the briefing that we held was, was focused on the intersection of students of color and students with disabilities in the discipline context to uh, evaluate what the federal government should and should not be doing with respect to school discipline. That, the, that issue is painfully resonant now uh, as there's been a, a nascent conversation in the Trump administration about whether we should turn our back on uh, the, the way that school discipline evaluation has been practiced and what it is that the law now demands and uh, perhaps rescind those practices and go in a different direction, which is uh, my own view, not speaking for the commission, which has not yet offered a report on this topic, but my own view profoundly misguided. Uh, but, but it is also resonant in our schools at all times. The, the reality is that the Office for Civil Rights, which I had the privilege to lead before coming to the commission, was created to enforce desegregation obligations in schools, was created to, uh, to enforce the non-discrimination principle with respect to race in schools. And the very first desegregation agreements that the Office for Civil Rights at the Department of Education secured and then enforced included the issue of racially disproportionate school discipline as elements of these desegregation agreements. So it is not a new phenomenon that we worry about that topic as a country, that we have seen racially disproportionate school discipline. And it is not a new phenomenon that the law demands non-discrimination with respect to race in the condition of all schooling, including the way that we discipline students. It is a new phenomenon that we have an administration that believes it does not have to have absolute fealty to the law. And that is, to me, terrifying. We have seen from this administration willingness to repeal uh, existing guidance and to say that whereas the law is what it is, we're not going to apply it. And this is not hyperbole. This is not my disgruntled response to uh, a new administration that is not doing things the way that I would, which I do feel. Uh, but, but it is the testimony of the Secretary of Education yesterday in her, the budget oversight hearing from Congress, where, uh, for example, the Secretary was asked when the Department of Education will at least follow federal law in those jurisdictions that have held that Title IX, which protects against sex discrimination, covers transgender students' rights in schools. And she did not say that they will at least follow the law in those jurisdictions where the courts have so ruled. And in fact, what the Department of Education has said on that question is that it will not, and that it does not have jurisdiction over transgender students' access to bathrooms and to locker rooms, even though, first of all, 
the law is what it is, and so they do have jurisdiction over it. But, but separate from that, the Sixth Circuit and the Seventh Circuit have unequivocally ruled, and at least in the states subject to those circuits, the Department of Education must follow the law as it has been interpreted by the courts to apply Title IX for students in those places, but they have said that they will not. So we have a backdrop. We have explicit answer from the federal government. We don't follow the law when it's not the law that we like. Now, we also have explicit answer from the federal government, a press release from the Secretary of Education announcing that in a new commission looking at school safety responsive to recent school shootings, one of the questions that this commission is going to take up is going to be whether to repeal guidance related to school discipline in schools. This new commission has four members. It's the Secretary of Education, the Attorney General, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, and the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. That is not the body that I think is well equipped to evaluate the way to issue guidance about discipline in schools. Uh, I will also say that this guidance, let me just say I signed this guidance, so I have strong feelings about it, but, but this guidance about discipline in schools that they are considering whether to repeal merely states what the law is, merely states what the law is and has been and how to comply with it. It is relatively non-controversial in that sense. It is also what the law is as described today in the Department of Justice Title VI Legal Manual, as described in the Bush II administration Department of Justice Legal Manual. These are not actually controversial legal principles. They are what the law requires from the experts in the Office for Civil Rights about the way that they will evaluate race discrimination in schools with respect to school discipline. So the notion that, that we maybe should re repeal that guidance, we should maybe rethink that and do something different is anathema to me because it is, it's not actually optional. It's not actually something that Congress has given the Office for Civil Rights the jurisdiction to reconsider, but it does send an unbelievably damaging message to students in schools consistent with the message that I was just describing. I want to share with you some of what I saw in investigations when I was at the Office for Civil Rights, which all of you can see yourselves as well because they are publicly available, which is something that we have not seen from this administration, but uh, I wish we would see. Uh, in one of the investigations about race discrimination with respect to discipline in schools, we saw that in more than a quarter of the disciplinary incidents my office reviewed, school staff could not explain a not racially non-discriminatory reason why there were material differences in the ways that students were disciplined for like behaviors. So that's a very, very large percentage of the time when there is no explanation that is non-discriminatory for race-based difference in the way that children are treated for like behaviors. I'm going to make that even more granular. <clears throat> in another investigation, there was a third grader who poked another child with a pencil, and that child, that child is black, that child received out of school suspension as discipline for having so poked another child with a pencil. A white third grader in the same school threw a rock, hit another child in the head, broke the teacher's sunglasses, and did not receive out of school suspension, but was invited to come and help the teacher clean the classroom multiple days at lunch as discipline for that student. There is no racially non-discriminatory explanation for the difference in the way that those two babies were treated. Another example. At another school district, black students were the only students who received out of school suspension for the first offense of the use of profanity in that district. White students received warnings and detention for the same behavior. In another district, a black kindergartner received a five-day out-of-school suspension for pulling a fire alarm, whereas a white ninth grader received a one-day out-of-school suspension for the same offense. And in still another district, a black 11th grader with no prior disciplinary record received a one-day out-of-school suspension for smoking tobacco, whereas a white 11th grader who had been disciplined twice before for smoking received only detention. These disparities for like and sometimes not that like behaviors uh, that have no explanation other than the race of the children involved are the kinds of concerns that give rise to federal non-discrimination law and that give rise to a need to evaluate the way the discipline is meted out in school. I look forward to what it is that 
the Commission will conclude in our forthcoming report on the topic. Uh, I do take some heart from the fact that the resolution agreements that I can unearth from the Office for Civil Rights continue to operate in effective ways, at least some of the time, and I'm going to share one of those from the Trump administration, and this is not the way that uh, the Secretary of Education talks about what it is that she hopes will be done in school, but it is what I think is important to think about for children. So this is a November 2017 resolution from a California school district, and there the district is uh, at maximum 34% Native American students. The, the, the um, ratios go up and down in different years, but uh, these students, Native American students, are fully 78.7% of students with disabilities in the district. And so it begs a question about the ways that this district is uh, respecting the personhood of Native American students in the first instance. Then we evaluate the disciplinary practices for these students. And uh, as an example, there was a first grade Native American student whose file had a note from the teacher saying that his, quote, behavior is keeping him from learning. Uh, and the student was suspended six times between September and March for that behavior that is keeping the child from learning, but the district did not conduct a behavior assessment or an evaluation for the child. They just continued repeatedly suspending the child as distinct from figuring out what it would take to support the student effectively in school. In another instance, a fourth grade girl had 43 behavioral inc incidents, 38 of which the district listed as major in a single school year. And the teachers noted that she had had problems focusing and repeated behavioral issues, ranging from tantrums to tears, but the district didn't evaluate her. So again, it was repeated discipline as distinct from figuring out how to support a child and uh, what it would take to make sure that that child can stay and be appropriate in school. So the district has entered into a resolution agreement with the Office for Civil Rights, which found that these, among other examples, violate the law and that there is a requirement for uh, the district to operate non-discriminatory disciplinary practices. So that's a ray of hope in the actual practices in the enforcement work in contrast to the uh, speeches and the public statements from the department. But they are also reminders that we as a community need to be vigilant about what it is that's happening in school. We did not read in the news about this little girl who had 43 disciplinary incidents in a single school year and who was disrespected because she is Native American the way that we did read and hear about the children in coats in the Baltimore schools. And we need to be outraged about both. And we need to be making sure that we are thinking about equity for both of those categories of kids and that we are thinking about equity in a way that is preventive and that gets, gets there in time so that our schools are actually delivering education of the type that we want that is about whom each child is, the value of each child, and the equity that we want to deliver, and the mechanism for achieving their dreams. Another uh, way that the Commission in this current time is evaluating educational opportunities in schools is an upcoming briefing that we have scheduled for May 11th, and that's focused on hate incidents, hate crimes around the country, and bias-related incidents in schools, the school-specific part of that will look at the ways that the Department of Education is uh, preventing and also enforcing laws related to racial harassment in school, disability-based harassment in school, sex-based harassment in school, to make sure that uh, we don't see hate incidents proliferating around the country in the way that statistics reflect that they are right now and that we operate our schools in ways that do communicate the equity that we want for our children in school. I want to uh, presage this briefing, which, as I mentioned, is coming May 11th. I hope that some of you might consider joining us in Washington, D.C. for the briefing and or sharing information that you would like the Commission to know and to use to rely on for the, the ultimate report that will follow because it is important to me that we hear the variety of perspectives that people have on the topics and the recommendations that people have for uh, what's, what is working well and what could be working better. Uh, so I, uh, I really do invite you to be in active conversation with us at the Commission about this topic. I want to tell you why this topic feels so resonant to me uh, now. Certainly, on a very personal level, I have two daughters. Uh, they are uh, in now fourth, uh, now actually, excuse me, fifth 
and eighth grade in school. Uh, last year, my younger daughter was in fourth grade after the presidential election. As you all may know, there, there uh, was a rise in hate incidents reported in schools, around the school right around the time of the election. And, uh, and in my community, there were quite a few hate incidents that were uh, explicit and explicitly tied to the election and that were relatively notorious in the community. So I was walking my uh, little fourth grader to school, and the day after the election, I saw signs posted outside the school from the teachers that said, you are welcome here. You are loved. This school is for you. And I am so glad that the teachers in the school thought to do that, did do that, made it explicit for all the children in my daughter's very multicultural school uh, so that they would know that this is a school that is for them and would be for them and would always be for them. So I say that to say there are some concrete, simple, specific things that we can do that will make the world of difference to the children who are faced with those kinds of signs and they are worth doing. And I also say that to say, uh, for my older daughter, who is in middle school, she also attends a very multicultural school. We uh, live in this pocket of amazing, terrific public schools that, you know, having been the chief civil rights enforcer in schools, I'm sure it will not be surprising to you that I was very careful about what kind of school I identified for my two precious babies. And, you know, these are amazing schools in every, every way. And even in places like that, the following can and did take place. My middle school daughter came home and told me that her friends at school had started playing a game. It's a terrorist. And they were saying it's a terrorist uh, to children who wore hijabs to school and uh, criticizing children as not being American because of their mode of dress at school. And I was horrified. My daughter is horrified. Her principal was horrified. The educators at her school was horrified. And they called together what they called a school-wide lesson to talk to children about the messages that they were sending and the community that we are and what we will do as a community to make sure that we communicate acceptance and appreciation for every member of the community, which was the right answer and it was the right thing to do and it is the appropriate way to respond to the kinds of harassment incidents that do come up, that we don't just hope might not come up, that do come up in communities all over the country that we need to be prepared for and that we need to be in advance ready for. There are other schools that don't have that kind of responsiveness, that don't recognize these kinds of incidents as harmful, that don't operate in ways that are immediately and effectively responsible. And I want to tell you a few examples of them. One is not far from here, uh, from the Melrose School District, which is uh, not far from this law school. Uh, there, the, the district had a policy of busing in children from a neighboring district as a way of trying to make the district more integrated. And one of the black students who was bused into this program, participant in that program, was walking back to class uh, one day, and uh, his, his teacher was trying to get him to move more quickly, and he, and he responded. His teacher, who was white, was trying to get him to move more quickly, and he responded in kind of a sing-song voice, and the teacher said, don't speak to me the way that a slave would speak to a master. The student was upset. To his great credit, the, his peers were upset. They reported to the principal that they were concerned about the way that the teacher had spoken to the students, and so the school brought the teacher together with the student to ask the teacher to apologize. Uh, the teacher's putative apology in that context was to say to the student, this is the way that slaves speak to masters, and so I wanted to educate you so that you would not do that. So the teacher doubled down, made it worse in the context of the apology, but the school didn't then see an obligation to take any further steps to communicate to that student, to the students around him, to the parents who are also upset that this is unacceptable here and that these are the steps that we will take to address a racially hostile environment that has now been created for the student among other students at the school. The Office for Civil Rights required that the district uh, do, do, did take those steps, and uh, the district is now subject to federal oversight to ensure that uh, that kind of uh, racially hostile environment does not persist. But I say those things to say that it's, it's not far from us, it's not far from now when instances of hate can come up in our communities. And we need to be vigilant, we need to be ready, we need to be thinking about what do we do about it, and we need to be spreading a message about 
what it takes to build and sustain and live the communities that we want in our schools that are fully and effectively prepared for all students. And so I see these three topics as component parts of the equity whole for schools and school communities. They are harrowing in the need for persistent ongoing vigilance in the, the variety of ways that we can work harm on other people uh, through inaction and through deliberate action. And uh, both are consequential from the perspective of the desktop, the student who is experiencing it. And I say them to say, as much as those harms are present today and have been a present part of the fabric of America for all of America. And so uh, that piece is itself frustrating and dismaying that we haven't gotten past it. I want to say we're not going to get past it. It's not going to happen that we will be able to achieve a moment where we can check the box on equity and we can walk away from it because that's not what equity means. The reality is that you always have to be vigilant. You always have to be thinking about how do we build and sustain and foster the community that we want. Thomas Jefferson was famous for saying that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And that is right. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. We always have to be vigilant about how do we protect the democracy that we want. And that, is, that can feel Sisyphean. It can feel frustrating. It can feel like this isn't my week for that. This isn't maybe my year or decade for that. I'm ready to be done with it. But now that we know that we will never be done with it, we can't be done with it, we need to, we need to be together, we need to link arms, thinking about how we sustain each other in doing the work and recognizing that the progress that we have made, as insufficient as it is, as much it is less than what we want, it is better than not making progress. And if we are not eternally vigilant, if we are not together linked arms, thinking about how we want to live the communities that we want to live. Those signs will not be up outside my daughter's school, saying, you are loved, you are welcome here, and the school is for you. And that would be worse. And I don't like that they needed those signs. I don't like that I have to have the conversations that I have to have with my daughters. I don't like giving the speech about the kinds of things that I think are absolute horrors that I see in schools, that I am devastated about still seeing in schools. But it will be worse if we are not vigilant about it. And so that means I really appreciate this good company today. I really appreciate being able to be in community with others who are standing for what is right. And I know that it is worth it and that the gains that we secure are worthwhile. And I look forward to securing the next ones that follow after them because that struggle is worth struggling toward. So I will end there and say thank you very much. Wasn't that a great talk? Thank you to Chair Lehman. And as we conclude, as a token of our appreciation for your, for your coming up here, we want to present you with a, a, a gift of a framed um, a poster of today's oh, event you. so you can remember <laughs> us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thanks for attending. <laughs>